I did want to thank everybody for joining us today. We have a great crowd, uh, just over 250 people um, online from across Canada. It's always wonderful to see that. Uh, we have a great group of speakers joining us today. Uh, one who has spoken a number of times and three newbies. I always look forward to hosting newbies, which is wonderful to see. Uh, before we get started, I did want to remind everybody uh, that the support for these events, uh, without the support of these events, we wouldn't be able to put them on for you. So supporting today from uh, Healthcare Excellence Canada, Carol Fancott is online. Uh, from Health Pro, we have Renato Desenza is online. From HEROC, we have Catherine Galton. Uh, from IQVIA, we have Robert McKay. Uh, from Medtronic Canada, we have Shane Russell. Navari Health, David Mosher is on with us today. And from TELUS Health, we have Saurabh Babat. Um, so I'm almost finished. I'm just going to quickly start sharing my screen here, and then I'll go through a couple last little things. Before we get started and I hand it over to the speakers, I did want to remind everybody that you can ask your questions. Um, there's obviously the little Q&A function, and you can ask your questions at any time. We'll have time at the end to address them. But even if we run out of time, I do forward all the questions off to the speakers afterwards. So feel free to ask as many questions as you can, because they will get a copy of all the questions, and they may have an opportunity to address them at a later point, um, whether or not it be through social media or just in conversation. But as long as they understand and know that the, the questions are out there, it helps them along the way with their work. So that is it from me. Enjoy the session, and I will hand it over to the speakers. Take care. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks to the sponsors. Uh, it's Kevin. I'm going to start off. Then I will yin and yang through this. Um, what is integrated care? Uh, you can see here uh, a, a coordinated, continuous system of care tailored to the needs of the patient and based on shared responsibility, well said. Uh, in our case, we, as an academic health science center, have tried to ensure that it is also evidence-based. And I want to chat with you in a moment about what the evidence for integrated care or models of integrated care have said, uh, starting in large part with the work of CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and of course, our own experience, uh, first at St. Joe's and then at UHN uh, and VHA over the past 10 years. Um, ultimately, the, chal the challenge, I think, in the, in the original days was wrapping comprehensive care around the patient. Increasingly, it's, it has a twofold model, wrapping comprehensive care around the patient and also wrapping support around providers. And never more than COVID have we seen the importance of easy handoffs, not only for patients, but increasingly for providers who are challenged. Maybe Matt, we could ask you to go to the next slide. So what does the literature say over a long period of time? Um, and it is of course care that is integrated across settings, across disciplines, uh, using common um, methodologies in terms of documentation. One or two very, very clear things. One, there must be, if it's a physician oriented model of care or a model of care that requires a significant amount of physician participation, dedicated and passionate physician leadership with uh, identification of physician leaders and the processes for standardization of the work of physicians and other providers, both regulated and unregulated. Increasingly, the benefit of digital health tools, a common documentation system, but it, re recently and increasingly, also models that allow us to look at how we'd add new technologies that allow home monitoring. Um, patient engagement would be another very important in, uh, part of this. KPMG did a study some years ago that said the, the engaged patient is 20% um, cheaper and 40% more satisfied. Uh, of course, ease of communication for patients in the care team. Sometimes that ease of communication is as simple as the use of a telephone. A single fund holder, and uh, can't underline strongly enough the importance of, uh, in, in a perhaps a slightly negative and pejorative statement, a single throat to choke, right? We've always heard since we started this work with the deputy of the day, my frustration is when things don't go well, I want one person to hold accountable or one organization to hold accountable. Clearly, this is, these are new models of care, and no model of care does well without education, development, the opportunity for us to challenge the ideas put, uh, put therein, 
and of course, um, last but certainly not least, rewarding that which we say we desire and the transparency of those rewards, uh, an incredibly important initiative as we go forward. Um, thank you. Uh, let, Catherine and I are now gonna introduce our organization. Catherine, do you wanna go first? Sure, happy to go first. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Nickel. I'm the president and CEO of VHA Home Healthcare. And on my side of the fence, Courtney Veen is here with me as well. He's the vice president of uh, strategic solutions and partnerships. Um, you're probably very familiar with UHN, but perhaps not as familiar with uh, with VHA. So I'm going to take a minute to uh, to share a little bit about us. Um, so VHA is a provider of home care services. We've been around since 1925, so we're coming up on our 100th birthday, which will be exciting. Um, by the numbers, we have a team of about 3,000, uh, including nurses, personal support workers, home support workers, and rehab therapists, all working in homes and communities. In 2002, we looked after uh, 113,000 uh, clients, both adult and pediatric, through over three and a half million visits. So uh, those are the, uh, the quantitative pieces. From a qualitative perspective, um, if I were to describe our, our differentiators or what we're known for, VHA is a values-driven social enterprise and many of us work at VHA because of our not-for-profit charitable status. We're a research organization with a deep understanding of our obligation to use and share our data to advance the sector. And we are Ontario centric with most of our strength in the GTA. So our specialty is urban home care. So Kevin, back to you and Carolyn. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Very quick uh, overview. You can see the member organizations in part uh, listed on the screen. Just to draw attention, it's University Health Network, not University Hospital Network. And while we operate some of Canada's largest hospitals, we're the largest hospital system in Canada, the most research intensive hospital system in our country. We also are increasingly moving into other appropriate services, a la uh, integrated care, like prescribable housing through our social medicine program, including long-term care, which we've been in the business of for some, some time, including UHN at home, looking at how home care services exist, and things like our NORC projects, uh, naturally occurring retirement communities and aging in place. Uh, obviously, lots more on the web if you'd like to go to the UHN website and learn more about us. Thank you. Maybe we'll go to the next slide. And Catherine, I think you wanted me to start this one off. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. So, um, Carol, I, I should have mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Carolyn Goss is with us here today. Yeah. Carolyn is, is the undoubtedly the most experienced person in Canada in integrated models of care. Uh, Carolyn has been working in this field for about 11 years and did much of the pioneering work in Hamilton. Uh, very fortunate to see Carolyn join us uh, here at University Health Network and build on the work that uh, we did together in the early days, about 11 years ago, at St. Joseph's Health System and latterly are now expanding that at University Health Network. And how did it come about? Really uh, a, a model of local governance being effective, where at a board retreat many years ago, board members talked about the frustrations they were having with their frail elderly parents or their kids with chronic disease. And very simple things like, I don't know who to call. I can't get an answer. I'm not sure what to do with the points of transition. So the family doc has made a referral, but I haven't heard from the specialty doc or hospital. But someone told me my loved one has to go to rehab or long-term care or home, but I can't seem to get a good understanding of what will happen when they do. Uh, someone suggested to me that maybe my home should be assessed before I go home. I don't know how to make that happen. So that with that model, the care team sat down in those days, we were fortunate, I think the first in the province or country to have in, embedded in our organization, a home care agency. And together really brought the acute care team and the home care team in those days, and I wanna reinforce those days are very different than now, to say, what is it that you can do and will do and wanna do? And what is it that the other part, half of the system can do, will do and wanna do? And two things we discovered in the, the start out. One, 
a massive um, malabsorption of what of an understanding, particularly of those of us who work in hospitals, of just how rich, diverse, demanding, complex home care is, of underestimation of the kind of patients and frankly, the kind of settings that people were being cared for. Talking to home care workers who were going into environments that many of us would say are barely safe, if safe at all. Complexities, especially around the social integration and uh, issues of population health and poverty that were shocking to those of us who, who exclusively worked in hospitals. So really a, a shout out to local governance and the importance of it for challenging us to say, go away and fix this. You have the continuum in one organization, now make it happen. And thanks to Carolyn and many, many, many clinicians and those who support clinicians, we came up with five programs and happy to go into those in questions if you want. Laterally, when, when I came to UHN and, later, and Carolyn came a little after that, and then we had a great relationship with VHA already, uh, an opportunity to sit down and discuss, should we do this? Is this still relevant? Is the population, you know, UHN has some of the sickest people in the country. Is this the right population? And the answer was yes, yes, and yes. And um, really and truly, I think the inspiring component was at UHN, a very healthy patient partner program and very, very loud. And the patient partner pro program uh, co-chair for integrated care is Phyllis Perp, who's been an essential ingredient for us. And I know for VHA, a very robust dialogue with patients about what their expectations are. So a real caution to all of you, this really is about striking that balance about patients' expectations, patients' fears, patients and families needs, and now increasingly the same for our care providers who often feel like they don't have the tools to provide the quality of care that's required. Last, just before turning it over to Catherine, I think I wanna encourage the audience today to eradicate the view that there is a acute care period and a home care period. There is a, a period of comprehensive care and some of the work of integrated care is delivering acute care at home. And some of the work of a historical hospital stay may be home care in the hospital. And increasingly blurring those lines is a very important thing to the teams who do the work. Else we really don't form a team, we continue with silos. Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, so, so building on that, um, you know, our conversations with UHN about the opportunity started in, in the spring of 2019, which was um, a time when we didn't know we were walking into a global pandemic, but we were. Um, but certainly, yes, we had relationships, good solid relationships with UHN and I'm, I'm an, I'm an ex-UHN uh, employee myself. So, uh, you know, there was lots of, of reasons to, uh, to jump into a conversation. And in the early days, um, you know, it was Kevin and Sharan Isaacs, who was the senior director of the UHN Connected Care Program, which is what it was called at the time. You know, we were talking about were we interested in partnering to create this integrated care program. And so, and from our perspective, um, the answer as well was yes, yes, and yes. And I, I think we thought about it from three different areas, you know. Yes, there's strategic alignment. Yes, there's operational alignment. And yes, there's values-based alignment between the two organizations. And so, you know, strategically in 2019, we were actually actively developing our next five-year strategic plan. So 2020 to 2025. And we already knew that creating innovative partnerships, advancing integrated care models and playing an active role in the redesign of what we knew, the, a big redesign of the of the system was coming were, were our top priority. So this was a fantastic opportunity uh, to bring that to life. Um, operational alignment, we have overlapping service geographies and we know that we care for many of the same clients and families. And we both have teams with strength and depth in the city of Toronto and the GTA. So there was a solid operational uh, alignment there. And most importantly, um, values alignment. So, you know, the driver for both organizations was better healthcare experiences for Ontarians and for the health providers that look after them. So, um, so it was a yes, yes, and a yes from our perspective. And so, uh, uh, and it's been, uh, it's been an exciting journey ever since. 
So next slide, if you could, Matt. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk to you on one uh, integrated fund holder. And really for us, I think uh, it's a one team means person-centered care, regardless of who's delivering it. Uh, a true team, that regardless of location, that actually gets together, knows one another, appreciates each other's skills, respects, and has confidence that the people providing care in the hospital have the confidence of people providing care in the home and vice versa. It, these are not invisible people to one another. They know one another. They're on the same team. They work together regularly. They see their patients consistently. And it really makes a massive difference as opposed to the often fragmented home care system literally around the world where a home care worker may see a patient once or twice, but not have that consistent care and not be part of a consistent care team. We all know clinically, if I only see you once, I have no idea in context to say you were better or worse yesterday. And uh, what, what may appear as a great decline, if I'd seen you regularly, would be completely missed behaviorally if I didn't actually become part of that team. The one integrated fund holder, not only for the accountability process, but also for responding to the needs of the, of the provider and the needs of the consumer. And so, um, you know, in, in the spirit of the title today, which some of you will know is a Shakespearean quote, um, break a few rules, right? So in the event that we had a home care visit where what, what the client really wanted, what the client's greatest anxiety was, may or may not have been exactly what um, a uh, home care uh, agreement says we should deliver. Our focus was on what do our clients need? And of course, we're going to remain true and responsible to the resources we steward from our ministry and Ontario Health and others, home care, uh, HCCSS, but really and truly putting the support where it's needed and trying to minimize the amount of uh, unnecessary administrivia, both for clients and for uh, providers, very important. Just before passing it to, to Catherine, I'll also reinforce Again, that evidentiary background that we keep going back to, let's look at the literature, let's contribute to the literature. So in that one team, a case navigator found to be very important, um, multidisciplinary care team for planning and for delivery, uh, an opportunity to go back and look at who is the competent person at the lowest cost who can do this work with joy in their work. And I really want to underline joy in their work, both in hospital and in community. And of course, looking at what are the results, because we have been doing this for 10 years more, lower hospital admission rates, lower length of stay, lower readmissions, lower returns to the emergency room, higher patient satisfaction, higher provider satisfaction. That checks all the boxes for me. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks. And, and so I think the other two uh, pillars of a successful program is uh, one one record and one number to call. And um, with with one record, it, it, you know, it notes here that there's one shared uh, digital health record, but it's actually more than that. It's a shared client relationship management platform and a shared web based collaboration system. And so really, you know, having these three digital shared components in place is absolutely uh, critical for success. You know, um, both from a client safety and, and uh, quality of care perspective, but also for the, the, the care team to be able to uh, work collaboratively together and efficiently uh, together. Uh, the other key component is one number to call. And so Kevin's comment earlier about, I don't know, you know, I don't know who to call. Um, this, this couldn't be uh, more important. So having a 24 seven phone line um, and also making sure that there's uh, clinical and management on call um, during uh, you know weekends and uh, and evenings so that so that client questions concerns changes can be can be managed um, around the clock as they come up so um, I think that uh, achieving these early on in the program uh, absolutely critical to success so uh, moving right along Matt if you could Great. And I think this one, um, I'm happy to speak to this one. So this is this is the, the model of the of the program as it stands today. Uh, this is the structure. Uh, fairly simple. There are three main roles in the structure: the program lead, 
the lead home care agency, and then the uh, home care service providers with the patient and the family, of course, in the center. So uh, the program lead is the hospitals. Um, you know, Kevin has spoken uh, a lot about the role of the hospital as, as the lead, it, obviously UH10 in this case, and the fund holder. Um, so that's that. The lead home care agency might be uh, something new for, for folks to hear about. This, um, this is where the operational oversight of the integrated program sits with responsibility for things like program administration, vendor contracts, subcontracting, best practice, coordination, scheduling, the 24-7 phone line, on-call support, the electronic health record, reporting and analyses in the web-based collaborative space. Um, so, um, so that's uh, that's basically where the operational uh, oversight, the on-the-ground oversight sits. And Courtney is going to provide a little bit more detail on the role of the lead home care agency and the strengths that it brings to the model. And then, of course, there's service provision. So uh, frontline service provision, uh, RNs, RPNs, personal support workers, and the therapies, including dietetics, speech-language pathology, OT, PT, and social work. So currently, uh, VHA is the lead home care agency, as well as the primary provider of service because um, uh, the program is uh, is still fairly small in scale and scope, although it's got great aspirations for growth. Um, but I do think that as the program grows, um, the opportunity here is to bring in uh, additional service providers to provide um, depth and breadth through subcontracting uh, relationships uh, with the lead home care agency. So happy to answer questions on the structure uh, later if they come up. Um, but Matt, uh, back to you to change the slide. Thank you. Great. Um, so I just want to speak briefly about some of the uh, principles of integrated care. And I think really very much building off of what Kevin and Catherine have, have already given good examples of. When we are looking at the principles that drive all the pathways, and we certainly have very different pathways, both in, in surgery and in our medicine program and, and now in transplant programs. These are always the principles that ground us. So focusing on patient and caregiver needs, and that's not exclusively related to the clinical needs. It is often the other supports and, and enablers uh, that they need to be successful in, in uh, being discharged home early, preventing those readmissions. That really means taking a whole person approach. Um, so that's a really important uh, promise for building the care paths. Supporting um, care providers and quality of work life has never been more important as Kevin uh, you know, indicated earlier. And this is really uh, something that we're very mindful of when we're building the model, when we're building the, the partnership with, with VHA, how do we engage the staff, having dedicated staff, committing to the staff in terms of uh, hours of work and, and availability. If, if we're asking them to be you know, strong contributors to the team, then we owe them some accountability as well in terms of being able to support their training, knowledge needs, as well as um, you know, their, uh, their quality of work life. So that's a really important enabler. The care model really drives uh, the work, not the funding model. The funding is an enabler. And I think this is one of the key components of the, the bundle. And as Kevin was saying earlier as well, we don't see it as funding acute care and funding home care. It's funding the pathway. The funding really follows the patient and the resources and the team need to follow the patient for the best possible outcome and, and experience. Committing to key metrics. Uh, so certainly the evaluation is critical and, and this is really looking at it from many dimensions. So looking at it from the health system. So we do have good data that supports length of stay, readmissions, total days in hospital, and I think really a different way of capturing health system utilization but also importantly, measuring patient and provider experience in that as well. Enabling uh, the work through digital strategies. So we certainly are embedding the digital record as well as the um, you know, access for patient remote monitoring, virtual uh, care, but we never lose sight that they should be enablers and they are not the primary focus of the model. It is always, how do we best support the patient? And that can be as easy as a phone call from the patient. And, and touching base uh, with them, responding to their needs. So we're very flexible, but absolutely using the digital enablers where, where they make sense and where they uh, drive a better, better outcome. And all of this uh, ultimately needs to result in sustainability and scalability. So, you know, as we 
have implemented this for a few thousand patients, and I know we'll speak about that in a few minutes. Um, it really is how do we bring this to scale so that we can be sustainable, so we can build out a model and really demonstrate the impact of this, this type of work on a larger scale. One of the really important pieces of the work uh, with our partnership with VHA certainly, but also I would say with our partners uh, within the organization and other community partners is transparency. Uh, and, and I think that has been a real key to the success of we're learning we're a learning organization or a learning partnership. We need to be able to know how we're performing, when things are going well, what needs to be adjusted. So transparency on the data and utilization and experience of all of our providers and patients across the system is, is a key component of that as well. And shared accountability. Uh, although UHN is the, the bundle holder, uh, we all feel incredibly accountable for the care that we're providing to patients. And I think that's something that, uh, again, is really built into the transparency. Great. So thank you. So I, I'm I'm going to go through a little bit of a comparison around the traditional healthcare uh, versus our integrated care model. But I want to preface this slide by saying that the traditional model that we're talking about really relates to a certain population of the clients that we see in home care. And for those colleagues on the line who are in home care, you'll realize this. For those who aren't, you may not as much. But we're, as we talk about traditional healthcare, we're looking at those who've had more a direct route through the hospital and really from an adult lens, adult model lens, where in home care, we see many other patients from different routes, clients that we call long stay clients, community clients referred without a hospital stay, PEDS clients, palliative clients, just to name a few. So I just wanted to give that preface. And I also want to apologize as I continually flip between the use of client and patient. And so in the context of what I'm going to say, they mean the same thing. So based on the eight guiding principles that Carolyn discussed, you know, what we've developed is a continuous comprehensive care model for patients with the UHN integrated care program. In the traditional healthcare model, what we look at is, you know, and, and we often refer to those clients from a home care lens as short stay clients, but the patient enters the hospital and receives care with a hospital stay. When deemed appropriate for discharge, a hospital care coordinator is included. They assess the eligibility for home care, get services set up. And once that client goes home, the care gets transferred to a community care coordinator who works with various organizations around the care and service provision. So in this model, the traditional healthcare model, we see hospital funding that's separate and distinct from the home care funding with multiple medical records at play, multiple contacts for the patient to reach out to, and possibly even more than one provider organization that's involved in providing of the care. The other aspect in this model also is a limited bi-directional info sharing. So there's no direct access often to the hospital team for that frontline home care provider. In our integrated care model, the patient care journey is continuous. So the integrated care lead is involved with the patient at their earliest point. So um, it could be as early as their pre-op visit. So the earliest point in hospital admission that IC lead has an opportunity to review expectations with the client, to talk about the program. It also gives an opportunity for that IC lead to really identify any early barriers that might present themselves that relate to discharge. Because that integrated care lead is embedded within the patient unit, they're also working very closely with the hospital team, with the client or patient, um, the care partners, um, to help support personalized care needs. But at the same time, they link in with their home care colleagues to start planning their earliest return home, return home possible. So it's very important in that kind of discharge planning is that it starts early. There's a co-created care plan that includes the full team, the hospital, client, care partner, and home care with a, with a goal to kind of get the patient home safely as early as possible for the right care in the right place. Once that patient actually returns home, the IC lead remains a point of contact and they're in daily contact with the supervisor for home care. There's one funding envelope and that envelope carries the patient across their, 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 their care continuum. There's one medical record shared by the team, one point of contact with a 24 seven phone line that a patient uses to access their entire care team. And the ability for that bi-directional dialogue is there with info sharing um, for, you know, done by the integrated care lead. 
as well as, well, so of course, with the one medical record. The frontline provider in this model has access back to the hospital team at any point in that patient's journey. Next slide. Right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the lead home care agency model. Um, and I'm going to do it in brevity because I know Catherine spoke about some pieces already, but I want to highlight some of the benefits of it. You know, in the current structure, BHA functions in the role of the lead home care agency model. And our model encompasses things such as a 24-7 phone line, a 24-7 on-call clinical support, the development of best practice pathways that are co-designed that really look at identifying the best care in the best place along the continuum. Back to what Kevin was saying around sometimes it's acute care happening in the home, and sometimes it's home care happening in the acute care setting. So, so you know, really looking at designing a model that 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 encompasses what's best and what is reconfigurable based on the needs of each separate client or patient. Scheduling coordination is a to meet the needs of the patients as part of the the um, lead home care agency model. Partnering and contracting with other health and community partners, medical equipment vendors, and others who are important in terms of the care of that individual are done to the lead home care agency, and the provision of that comprehensive digital documentation suite that Catherine spoke of. So all of this has been really important as we look at factors for success. Next slide. Carolyn, I think you're on this. Yes, one. I am. Um, so I'll I'll just touch on this briefly because I think we've we've uh, likely highlighted in, in some of the other con uh, parts of the conversation. Um, but improving work uh, life um, for providers uh, again really key, and and that's building on the you know the learning culture and trust and openness we spoke about earlier. The um, the funding model, so reducing the per capita uh, cost of healthcare is one that um, is balanced, I would say, in the early stages of this model with having a different type of staffing available. So we're really trying to move away from the proverbial paper visit model um, that we are all eager to move away from in, in the appropriate circumstances. But that means an investment in having available staff, full-time staff. So these things are all very connected. So that's another important success factor, but one where we, as we expand uh, with partners that we you know we want to be able to continue to build on and find <clears throat> excuse me more efficiency um, improving the health of populations we started with very defined patient populations for a reason um, it, it is it's a when we look at the maturity models for integrated care uh, you often start or start with very specific patient populations to be able to demonstrate it's easier to demonstrate the impact and the outcomes because you have good comparators you can build a solid foundation around the process but what we're experiencing now, particularly in our medicine population, is really an opportunity to be uh, building on more of a population health approach. So we're less focused on the specific um, you know, clinical disease and more around what the patient needs are uh, from a short stay perspective. So I think we can go to the next slide. I know we're gonna be a little pushed for time because I. Mm -hmm. Take some time for questions, so we'll try to go quickly on these last few slides. Great. So, not to repeat what 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 Carolyn spoke about already, but these are some of the words that really help, help to punctuate, um, um, you know, uh, what's been a success. And I'm going to skip over a lot and just go to what I think was one of the most important factors, which really has been that transparency that we've had with one another along the way. And that has been so key to developing the trust required to make this both a success for our teams, as well as a success for our patients. So next slide, Matt. Hope you're on mute, Caroline. Jeez, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, so patient experience, obviously, really critically important. And just to highlight some of the areas where we've been able to demonstrate that. So really high uptake on the 24 seven number, can't uh, overstate how important that is for the patients to be connected to the team. And they're connected to the, uh, you know, the IC lead and the team before they leave the hospital. So they really see that as a continuum and they leverage that very heavily. Um, and in terms of scope, so 11,000 home care visits to date, 
and again, compassion and equitable care. So the we are obviously focused on the clinical aspects of care, but really taking a whole person approach to care. So it is not only the um, the clinical needs of the patients in the home, but what are some of the other supports that they need? And this is where we really leverage the whole team to help identify needs that perhaps weren't identified in hospital or address changing needs in the community. And that's where that collaboration amongst the team is so critical. Thanks. And just jumping in here um, briefly uh, to share with you the results of a provider feedback survey that we did very recently, actually, February, just in February of 2023. Uh, to show um, you know the really positive feedback that we're receiving from the dedicated team that uh, that is part of the that is uh, leading the UHN uh, IC program. I'm not going to go through the the statistics that um, because you can see them here and read them uh, through on your own. Um, but I think that you know it's always so important when you're looking at um, feedback that you whenever you're looking at client feedback that you're also looking at provider feedback as well because the two are inherently inherently linked and as we all know are uh, are both um, key elements of the uh, of the quadruple aim that we all adhere to so closely so really pleased to share this this really positive feedback um, from the dedicated provider team next slide please matt mm -hmm. Here, I'll just share a, a quick example, but I think it's illustrative of the experience of many patients in the program. Um, Reva was a, is an example of a, a caregiver to a patient uh, who uh, had surgery at uh, UHN and was in the program. Uh, her brother has uh, lives with his mother who is older, an older adult, um, and she is a, an extended caregiver, but not living in the home. Brother has many uh, complex medical issues and has been uh, in interacting with the healthcare system for many years. Not always very positive experiences in the sense of care not being connected, having difficulty uh, getting responses to questions or, or support after he's been discharged home. And the, her feedback really was that this was uh, just such a different experience than they had uh, you know, seen uh, prior to this. She really felt connected to the care that her brother was receiving both in hospital and at home, felt that she was able to support her mother as the other caregiver to, to her brother and really felt like she was able to connect. So that was through the 1-800 number. It was also through conversations with the home care team, with the IC lead in the hospital, quick connection back to the team. And I think it just illustrates how important that support is for, for patients and you know, for someone who's experienced the health system extensively. I think that feedback was really valuable. So I'm um, happy to jump in here. I think Kevin and I were going to share this slide. So this is just uh, it gives you a picture of where we started. Um, the the uh, the original pathway was uh, thoracic surgery. That was the clinical population we started with, and the team designed care pathways and complication guidelines uh, to accompany, which was quite a heavy lift in the early early days with lots of cross learning about uh, the two different sectors. Um, but there, there was a third party evaluation done um, on uh, discharged patients between June 1st, 2019 and February 29th, 2020. Um, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic to, uh, to have these results and to be able to share them uh, with you. The comparative population was historical UHN thoracic patients who were discharged during the same time period to the previous year. Um, so certainly uh, you can see here um, patient caregiver and clinician uh, experiences were positive and uh, quality outcomes were also uh, really positive with 28% shorter overall length of stay risk, 48% lower ED visit risk and 33% lower readmission risk uh, than historical patients. Um, so Kevin, over to you to add anything. Or maybe just a quick uh, add around COVID, post-COVID, and the government's agenda. So um, Minister and Deputy Premier Jones and Premier Ford have made very clear they really want us to catch up on our surgical backlog. They'd really like to see emergency room wait times go dramatically down as we and patients would. And when you look at this data, the ability to put more people through the same number of beds, particularly in surgical disciplines, decrease emergency room utilization, and decrease hospital admissions 
it would be our thesis supported by research that this is a great tool and a scalable tool, uh, assuming we, we kind of stick to the rules and monitor and measure that really allow us to uh, dramatically improve our efficiency. Um, it is predicated on, however, this is not a cost saving strategy. I want to really underline that. If the objective of this is to close beds and make it more efficient, I don't think you're going to engage a clinical team to do more with less at a time when clinical workload is so challenged. This is about in, uh, in cost avoidance, improvement of quality of work length, improvement of, of the quality experience, shortening wait times, being more efficient in hospital, and getting people where they want to be served, which is home. And we'll go on to our last slide, so we leave you a few minutes to grill us. And I'll just recap this very quickly. So just around the work done to date, uh, the the team, the connected care team, so Shri and Isaac and team who are not here today but have really done the heavy lifting on this, um, have supported over uh, thirty thousand patients in the COVID pneumonia pathway um, over the the last few years. So this was uh, built off of the uh, the team that was supporting integrated care. With our experience uh, with our VHA partners, we have supported uh, over 3,500 patients directly in our surgical and medicine programs and in the COVID pneumonia pathway uh, this past year, and really looking to expand uh, the model across you know, the patient populations that Kevin just highlighted, those where there really is a critical need. Um, and as we say, we're not looking to you know, save money, we're looking to create capacity, but do it in a way that is also providing better care for patients that are in the system. So if we can support patients more effectively at home, that creates capacity in the hospital to help address some of those uh, backlogs in, in surgeries and some of the much needed capacity that we're searching for in the system. Carolyn, maybe I'll just make one quick add, and that is the evolution of digital health. You'll see under the CHF cardiology box, an essential ingredient for us on that one, Heather Ross, who leads our division of cardiology, is something called Medley. And it, is, uh, it really allows us to use digital tools in the home that engage patients in their, the management of their chronic disease. And in each of these with artificial intelligence, expanded digital health, very excited about where this can go. And I think we heard Minister or Premier Ford say, Canada wants to be, or Ontario wants to be a leading jurisdiction in digital. Uh, there's a massive opportunity to bring digital, particularly to smaller and remote communities where you, we can bring clinic, expert clinician support and monitoring to communities that have the, the, perhaps the worst access to physician and nursing expertise. Thank you. I, Catherine, I think, uh, Catherine, Courtney, and uh, um, Carolyn, I think we're done, or do we have a, another slide on key learnings? I, I think we've covered all the key content. So Matt, we're back to you for questions. Fantastic, um, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna quickly try and uh, group in some of the questions here into, but again, if you have questions, ask them as I will be forwarding these questions off to the speakers afterwards and it helps them in knowing what the healthcare community thinks and uh, what else is happening out there. Um, Kevin, I'm not sure if you may be able to address um, the significance of health practitioners working alongside physicians. Is this effective? Well, absolutely. And I, I think the uh, other uh, provider or providers, both the 43 regulated uh, health professions in Ontario, as well as extenders, um, if we really look at the kind of heroes of our healthcare system through COVID, everybody has done a fantastic job. But in this program, our PSW colleagues are the glue that continues to hold our system together. And uh, as we all know, it, that isn't always the most attractive career path. I wanna compliment our partners at BHA for making it a much more attractive career path. But when you're able to bring um, providers in, the advantage we have at UHN of having the Michener as part of our family to begin thinking about micro-credentialing, appropriate extenders, training programs, in areas of digital health, we cannot and will not immigrate or train our way out of our RN shortage. We absolutely need to think about uh, what, who else can join the team. And Matt, last but not least, there's new team members that when I started and many of us started, we'd never have thought about. So digital scientists, big data experts, uh, algorithm mathematicians, they're, they're increasingly part 
of a care team at a, at a research intensive organization like ours. And we want to see those translated into commercializable products that are, again, driven by what patients want and need and what clinicians say makes sense to them, as opposed to it being a, a kind of disjointed process of commercialization through the billing chain. So 100% could not make this work without uh, the broader broader uh, colleagues. And scope of practice, a big, big issue. We haven't had a chance to talk about that today. But moving to full scope of practice, appropriate delegation, standing orders. I'll just give you a quick example. We're not contacting a respirologist to say, you know, patient X seems to have an exacerbation of their COPD or CHF. We're actually saying in the event that that occurs, here are the next range of drugs that's pre-approved in a digital order set that allows us to move to those. And obviously link back with the most responsible physician, navigator, nurse, nurse practitioner, whoever the right people are. And of course that single record for those who wanna review the chart, uh, including our experts in pharmacy, looking at appropriate drug interaction and utilization. Uh, quickly, just because, especially with the way you you ended that, um, there are a number of questions with regards to um, the records and the accessibility of the records. Um, I'm wondering whether or not anybody wants to comment on how accessible are the records for everybody involved, and are they shareable with uh, organizations outside of this group? Um, just kind of just kind of wrap up the whole record and the accessibility and the use of it. I don't know if anybody wants to address that. Courtney, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, so what I'll share, you know, currently, you know, patients, clients don't have access to that record. However, the, the shareability across our partnership currently exists. Um, you know, there is a portal that has just that has just been launched that allows some information to be accessible to, um, to patients who are interested. Um, the work has started around how do we or how could we. So we have other partner organizations who are providing frontline care who are able to also access the same um, the same record. So so it is expandable, um, but that you know requires work. It depends on what system another one has. All all those elements, but um, that, that's where we're at so far, Carolyn. And and I would just add, and I think there there is a you know a, a maturity model and a strategy around the digital access for sure. Um, and one of the advantages that we've had at UHN is the implementation of our Epic record last summer. So we now have the ability to give patients access to that uh, part of their record. So we're able to start bringing patients in um, to have the clinical record, but also opportunity to share and communicate with patients through that record. The, I think the, the art will be over the long term is to really integrate, fully integrate those records between the community and, and hospital, but the teams have access to that information. And I think that's that's a, a huge leap ahead to what is currently existing in, in the community. Uh, in yep. our process, mm -hmm. we also mm -hmm. do uh, request of the patient the ability to share the information mm -hmm. amongst comprehensive care team, regardless right. of where that care team resides. And Absolutely. Yeah, patient who doesn't want us to do that. They yes. absolutely want all of their care team members to have mm -hmm. access to their full information. That's right. yep. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll quickly do one last question and then wrap up. And again, I will forward off the questions, but uh, there were a number of questions with regards to the partnership and integration and work with primary care. Um, and I'm just wondering whether or not anybody might want to address that. Uh, I, sure, I can speak to it and others can certainly jump in. So it, it is a, absolutely a very critical um, members of the team. So we work with a number of uh, teams such as uh, SCOPE uh, in Toronto. So, um, and linking with some of the primary care physicians also through uh, the family health team. And it is a part of particular importance in our medicine pathway, certainly important in, in surgery, but particularly important in, in medicine. So we, um, we do connect uh, with those teams on a very active basis. Uh, so a good example of that would be the work that we're doing around heart failure. So we're working with our local OHT, uh, as Kevin said earlier, around the medley implementation, which is the aspect of it. But we're working directly with our CHCs and family health team and scope to implement those, those pathways and to be connected with the primary care teams. We also have some support in, the, in our connected care hub 
uh, for NP support to help bridge where there uh, you may be some delays in, in access to primary care or the patient doesn't have a, a primary care access and we're working through that process. So we can support uh, as needed, but really the primary um, point here is with, is with our primary care docs. And Matt, one, one observation out of the, our, our research and evaluation, and that is particularly in chronic disease management, we see a subset, small number, 15% of people who stay with an intensive program like our medley program, like a uh, like very intensive hospital associated COPD program, but the vast majority after depending upon the care path 30, 60, at most 90 days, mm -hmm. transitioning back to their care team through primary care and hopefully in future their OHT. And then there is that small number, 15%, who their, their um, benefit of staying in an intensive program dramatically decreases their exacerbations. And we're talking about people who historically would have 10, 12, 15, 17 exacerbations of things like heart failure, COPD, other, other uh, chronic diseases. So uh, very important to make sure we recognize the majority back into the primary care system, a small minority at highest risk, who are very much benefit main, being maintained on a program at this intensive. Uh, thank you. Um, quite obviously, especially with the number of questions, the number of attendees we had today, this could have been a full day, um, but uh, part of what we wanna do is we wanna keep these short, intense, and you know, offer the opportunity to keep conversations going. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Wonderful topic, wonderful discussion. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.